welcome to the uh, GM stage. Um, today I want to introduce a bit like why we decided to move from uh, Web 2 to Web 3 with our game startup. So my name is Roman. I'm uh, in games since 2011, in esports since 2015, and crypto fairly recently, so like 21. Uh, so I'm not the OG in the space by all means. Uh, I'm here to learn. It's my third company I'm founding. I had a game studio before, very early, like 2011, when I was a student, and did a nutrition startup in between. Um, have built, I think, four or something games from uh, idea to launch, and have been involved in like over nine games in different uh, reason, like like positions, uh, either as advisor or producer or founder or whatever. Um, I'm advising game startups also from time to time, and below are some companies I worked with on games. So, yeah, Volkswagen, not, not the sexiest one. Uh, Wuga, we did a project with in Berlin, and uh, Amazon, I did a project with Game Studios, and uh, Bitcraft, uh, I started very early there as one of the first hires on finding new trends to invest in, uh, and ultimately, one thing uh, that happened was Legendary Play. Um, we started out as a mobile free-to-play studio, so our DNA is free-to-play mobile. Uh, we are a team of 20, mostly in Berlin. Some team members are here. Uh, and we have released one game already, which is um, eSports manager game uh, on uh, iOS and Android. And uh, we are making a new game. And with that, we are transitioning from Web 2 to Web 3. There are some of our uh, partners and uh, investors below. And yeah, so today I want to talk a bit about like business models, free to play, um, web free, how does it all come together, why we think it makes sense to go to web free, and why not everyone is doing it at the moment. So our story is 2017, we started with the game startup. Um, the idea was to create new game experiences for esports fans, so not just like another League of Legends or Counter Strike, but some new idea we had, uh, which was then the first game was the manager game. And the dominant business model at that time for games was and still is today free to play, uh, as I guess a lot of you guys know. Um, why is that? Because it simply works. So last year we had like 76 billion um, dollars revenue for in-game item sales alone. But uh, have been working in industry and built free to play games myself. Um, I think it's a bit like, like this, uh, which is of course uh, <laughs> maybe a bit hard to say. It's not every game developer is like this, but basically you could say free to play is the art and science of milking gamers for money. Uh, so you, it depends. I mean, some companies are nicer, and they basically build a game which is fun. And then at some point, you can spend on customization items. You don't need to spend to progress in the game. If you want, you can. But you can play it for years. Can be even come to the top ranks without spending any money. Those are the nicest one, one, uh, one developers. And then there's others who basically know exactly how uh, the game behavior and the psychology behind, behind game playing a game it ticks and how they funnel you into spending as most money as possible. I think we heard before a talk today where the goal was to get at least $2,000 uh, a month uh, from players. Uh, I know companies where the ambition is much higher. Uh, it's basically to get super mega whales. They spend like 200 k a month on a game. Um, and yeah, that's basically the current state of the games industry, I would say. Uh, there's big games companies making a billion uh, on, on games where you basically, I mean, the evil ones is where you cannot pass a certain stage in the game without spending money. Uh, so stuff like this exists. Um, yeah, so basically free to play is one side. Um, so there's a lot of money coming in from gamers. They get nothing back in return other than, I would say, fun and pain. Um, and from a business side, as a game developer, it's also very expensive to build those games. So uh, this part here, can you see my dot? No. This part here, idea to, to making millions, is basically a bit like a very simplified roadmap on how you build a free-to-play game. So you have an idea, you know your audience, um, and if you're smart, you test this idea very early. So you don't just start building a game, but you test if the audience is actually interested in the game. And you can do that by fake store marketing pages. You launch a campaign on Facebook. You say, like, do you like our mock-up? OK, then click here on the install button. But then there is no game. There's just the email sign-up because the game is not yet there. 
but at least to get an understanding uh, how many users would be interested in this game, what is the uh, conversion, um, what is the cost to get people to click this button, so you have an understanding. And then if that is positive, you start out building the game, um, which in production there's several uh, gates normally, like internal gates. At bigger companies, you have a lot of discussion about budget, and it's very um, bureaucratic uh, and uh, politic. In smaller startups, you just go with it, and you try to get traction as much as possible. At some point, you will reach a kind of soft launch, uh, which normally is defined as the first contact of the game with real users. So you launch it in one or two territories, often Philippines or uh, um, uh, like Netherlands or something, so small territories where you have cheap um, marketing channels, still English as the dominant language. By this time, when you launch in today's game world, you uh, might have spent already one, two, three years of development. You might have spent already millions of uh, money. You mostly will not have monetization at this stage. You are aiming for proving that your game is fun by retention. So you try to prove first day conversion should not suck depending on the genre, different numbers. Uh, third day retention is the next step. It is like the core loop. Is it fun? How sticky is the game? And then you progress onwards and you build more and more features um, until you kind of come to a global launch. Before that, you will have test monetization already, how many people spend how much money per day in the app. It's very data driven. Um, the, I would say the golden formula is always CPI, so cost per install. Uh, lower than LTV, lifetime value of a user. So at this stage, if you achieve this on scale and you pour in millions of marketing money, you basically print money. And this is what all big game developers and small and investors want to have, basically printing money with game. And uh, yeah, most fail at this. Most games are not even getting back the money they, it costs to build them. And by now, it's also an extremely competitive market. Uh, I think there's a crazy number, something like 2,000, 3,000 games a day launch in the app stores. Um, of course, different quality, but still, you need to get visibility. You need to get uh, users to even look at your game, right? And you have to compete against millions of marketing budgets. So uh, one thing we saw with our game, which we launched one, two years ago, um, we started out with a CPI of, I think, 50 cents. And we have a very specific audience as eSports fans. And then it rose to like three dollars, which is a huge jump. Uh, but without us really changing anything, or without us tapping in the market, it was basically, I would say, COVID happened. Uh, game exploded. Uh, big companies consolidated. They spent a lot of budget. Facebook basically has an algorithm where it pairs you against other budget spend, so you have no chance to compete there really with just like performance marketing. So basically, performance marketing is kind of dead for small and mid-sized uh, uh, studios. And now, uh, I would say last year, really, um, this, one, this happened. Uh, of course, it's not the messiah, but it's some interesting things here which I want to talk today. Um, and a lot of studios, which was interesting, already jumped on this for, I think, different motivations, um, but way more faster than it happened with free-to-play. So I think the industry as a whole is way more open to changes because they saw what free-to-play can do in a short amount of time. And I think Web3 has the same power to really change the games industry um, and hopefully to the better. So um, why we think it's interesting, why we make the move is for once there is just a lot of money already there. So I think this number is one I found with like 4 billion this year and the year is not even uh, like half of the year has passed and I think 4 billion was already the number that got invested in Web3 gaming. Mostly of course in funds, platforms, but also projects. Um, there's a lot of very smart guys already in the space. Um, directors from bigger studios went to web-free companies, went to blockchain, uh, scaling solutions for games, whatever, and there's more and more making a jump. You then can do very cool things uh, with web-free gaming for a design perspective, for example. Uh, imagine a game item which can uh, change stats over time. You get ownership, you can trade it on market, you really own it, um, stuff like this, which has not been doable before, and then we can argue, you could say you have always been able to do that game developer where you didn't do it, why you need blockchain for this, uh, and we can talk about it. Um, and I think very important is also the point about the community. So games always need a community. Good games always only work if the community is strong, but with Web3 Gaming, the community is even more involved. So they have 
more, they can say you work with them way earlier, uh, they have more contribution, and they also can get that money they put in. Um, and one thing I heard over and over again, talking to a lot of um, blockchain scaling uh, and chain solutions, is they believe that games are the biggest uh, driver for mass adoption of blockchain, for the simple reason that games is the biggest used medium in the world. And that is a bit like what we think, but it's also like what I hear. And please remember, all of this is like there is no, no playbook yet, right? So it's all like, I think, two years old. I think the first crypto game was 2016 or something. I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, we try to figure it out. So why we think it makes sense to go to Web2.3 as a game developer, it's basically, and I, I speak very honest uh, from, a, from a business standpoint, it's, it's to reduce the risk of losing your money in a game that no one wants to play. Um, because you need to find your community way earlier um, and you involve them way earlier and you can also cover some of the development costs earlier. So, and this has been done a lot of times now um, with NFT drops, token sales, land sales and all that. And basically you could start making revenue already in kind of like a marketing test stage where you say like we have a very strong vision about our game and you engage the community enough that they are willing to contribute time and invest already at this stage into the game. And that is not, not really new. It has been done with Kickstarter and crowdfunding campaigns before. I think the difference is that users now also get ownership of assets, which is a different thing to just backing someone at Kickstarter. And also, um, yeah, you have more to say. It depends on the governance. It depends on like a DAO structure and all that. But you at least have this option. And yeah, is it like now, is it fair, you know, is it okay to give the risk of a failed game partially to the gamers to, to, to back that? I would say, um, and there's been a lot of, like, like of, lot of shit shows, right, with um, we are going to build a sci-fi MLPG with a five-man team in a year and we raise 20 million and we have never built a game. Well, I think that will be hard to be honest. Um, but to reduce this risk, um, you should just look at the team, right? Where do we come from? Have to build a game, um, have the track record to reduce the risk of backing uh, rug pulls as well. Um, and I think overall, what you need to understand as a game developer is that you might have a larger piece with Web3, uh, a smaller piece of a larger cake. So that is a bit going into tokenomics. Don't want to touch it too much. But I think you need to be open to give parts of the game away to community and even maybe long term depends on how much you want to go web to free all of the game could be run by the community that is a very web free uh, I think um, interesting thought might not work honestly has not been done yet I've not seen yet the game which is run by the community I've seen it as a promise a lot um, and I think it will be very hard because uh, democracy makes shit games <laughs> so and I can tell you when you have a, a room full of game designers and you try to figure out a game, it's hell. So um, that will be very interesting. But the idea alone is, is, is cool to give a say to the community. Yeah, and if it's so great, uh, a rightful question. We had that at the uh, Avalanche event. Um, someone asked, like, why is not Riot, Riot doing it? You know, if Web3 is so cool, it gives so much back to the users. Why is not every game studio doing it? And some have tried and they failed pretty hard. Um, I don't know if you know the cases of some studios, but basically they announced, and now we're doing NFTs. And then there was a shitstorm of the community. And like one day later, they said, like, nah, we don't do it anymore. Um, why, why is the, the resentment so strong? Or why do we think the resentment is so strong? I think for once, it is not authentic with those studios, right? So EA, for example, has not the best image with gamers that they are like, honest about maybe good games and more about money. Um, and some games also don't really need it. And suddenly there is like Web3 and they see like big numbers with Axie, they see big investments and then basically print or try to, to make the fastest, maybe shittest way to get NFTs into the game to be part of their hype. Um, but they didn't really thought about it. And they also didn't ask really, is it actually what our users want? And does it make sense for them? And do we build a game where it is all makes sense to get ownership, to have a token, to have NFTs. And others simply, um, why should they even? I mean, they make so much money with free to play. Like per game, sometimes a billion per year. Why should they take the risk and build something new, which is scary, where you give ownership away, where you don't know how, how you do it yet. There's no like 
playbook, right? Free to play is all laid out. It's basically very much a copy shop at the moment where you just like you take one game, it works there, you make different art and you push it out in another country or in the same country even and, and try to beat uh, the other guys with marketing budgets. So that is a bit like <laughs> free to play. And the question is always like what you should ask yourself is like does our audience want it? Like is it, is it interesting for the community? And yeah, that is like headlines like this is one reason why of course people are waiting and bigger game studios who have maybe more to lose are also waiting. And, that study was interesting, um, which is like, of course, the headlining. They get picked up by other media and they push it out. But if you look into the details of it, it was interesting because only like 12%, and they asked 2,000 gamers. I don't know where the gamers come from. They said like global gamers. I don't know what that means. Uh, but 12% 12, 12 only of them really understood what NFTs are. 3% uh, only owned one. 1% 1 only made profit with it. So the overall experience of having an NFT at the moment in a game or getting one is also bad, right? And 86% hated it because of the fear it brings, what changes it brings to industry. And that is the point. Gamers are very passionate. They love their hobby. And they are scared if you change it or if you take it away. Um, but at the same time, I think it's also what you often see like a very vocal minority, which is a bit backed up by this number. If you only like 13% really understand what NFTs are, how can they even love it, right? Because no one <laughs> really, or, or like most of them never got in contact with, with one. So um, what I think you should do as a game developer is like ask your community what they think about it. We did that, we did this, this uh, survey here was with our game we have live now on Discord and we simply asked them what do you think about NFTs uh, right now? And to our surprise, we expected like this 70% like hate and some said like, yeah, it's cool, but our surprise was like majority said uh, they think it's great and some hate it and some will always hate it and also a big chunk does not even know what NFTs are. So you need to expect to educate people and your community about it and that of course will take time. And now let's talk about it why we think it makes sense for, for gamers um, to have that free game. So, I'm a gamer. I spent significantly amount of years of my life in games. Um, I'm, I'm not an OG in crypto by all means. I invested in some tokens. Um, I would say now it doesn't look so good like last year, but anyway, um, it was an interesting space for me financially, but not as a builder. Um, and my initial reaction as a gamer when I saw like play to earn happening was like yeah, face palm. So I thought like, okay, what, there was enough games. Why, why should I play it? Why, why like, things very poncy and all that. And there was a lot of scams and rugs and still happening today. I don't know the percentage, but it's huge with NFTs. Um, so my reaction was like this. And I had the same uh, resentment. I don't want NFTs. I don't need them in my games. The games I have are fine. I love to play them. Please don't, don't ruin them for me. But then I still, as an entrepreneur and from business side, I, I kind of like still got interested in it because there was so much happening. Of course, money, but also smart guys I knew tapped into this space. And then I found this um, pretty early, which some of you might know. It's the, the, on the front page of Gods Unchained, which is one game from Immutable. And as a gamer, this basically really stuck with me because it's true. So I spend more time than money, I would say. I'm not a whale in the games uh, I play because I also know how they are built. But I never got anything back from playing games, other than fun and pain, uh, but not any, any money I put in. And then I kind of like got this example for myself where I said like, okay, what, what will happen in the, in the future? Um, because if you imagine there is like two games and right now the, the crypto games suck quality. They are not like, we as game say like they're just not good games. They're not fun, they're not well made, the onboarding is terrible. So you need a token, you need to register, you need a wallet to play a game. No fucking way will you ever have mass adoption with those games. Um, so it's not, not interesting as a gamer and as a game developer to some degree. But what if someone makes it right? What if you will have two games, let's imagine like AAA quality, uh, super nice gameplay, super deep game mechanics, beautiful production value, it looks beautiful. And you have two games. One you only can put money in and the other one you can get ownership and partially you can get money out. Which one are you going to play as a gamer? And that is, was the point for me when I thought like, okay, this will happen. And I know already some guys work on really nice games, AAA, uh, AA quality, and I think some will launch this year, some will take more time. 
but it will happen. It's not a question if, but when. And then the question is what this will do to the, to the, to the games industry, right? Uh, because a Riot, for example, does not need to move, but maybe they will need to move if someone makes a similar cool MOBA, we will get ownership. And for me, that's not a question if, it's a question when. And realizing this, I said, like, okay, we need to do this. Uh, because we are a startup, and basically, I played like those games massively. So, World of Warcraft, I hate you, bitch. I spent <laughs> thousands of hours in this game. Uh, I dropped out of school when I was 16 to play World of Warcraft. Um, 10, 12 hours a day. Not the smartest life choice, maybe, uh, but yeah. It was just more interesting than school to me. Uh, I was one of the best in the server. Esports was not a big thing at that time. Um, never got anything back. What if I could have sold my character? Or at least don't, don't, like, at least own it. At least do with it what I want. At least I would have had something back from the years I spent there. Um, what uh, Diablo, I loved it. I played it like with my brother, I think, three times from start to top gear, rune words farming, trading was the best part in the game for me, just finding gear, trading with others. Then there was like a kind of like in forums we met, you could kind of like make deals to sell it for real money. It was not, um, not supported by the game developer, of course, but what if? What if that would be supported with good UX, good marketplace? Would it be more fun? Would it be more motivation for sure? At least I could also sell my stuff if I'm finished with the game and have something out of it of the time I've put in there. And uh, me and my brother, we, we played like Diablo 3 three times, so we got all the gear, then it was boring, deleted the character, half a year later we regretted it. Again, found all the gear, top spot, I regretted it, and just like three times, then we said, okay, now it's enough. Ultima Online is also one of my big uh, favorite games. Uh, for me, still one of the best MMORPGs ever. Very early, I think it was, I don't know, 1998 or something? Internet was <laughs> just there, and the game had everything. Housing, crafting, um, guilds, all of the stuff, even more than MMORPGs don't have. And how much more cool would it be if you get ownership, if you could trade stuff um, with your guild, for example, you know? So I think getting ownership in games and Web3 might not work for every genre, but specifically interesting for mid-core, hardcore games, RPGs, I think. And maybe to summarize a bit what's, what's out there now, so we have free to play, we cover that. Um, play to earn, I think, is the dominant thing when you think at blockchain games at the moment. Uh, it's the pioneer work, I would say. It's like uh, kind of like generation one of blockchain games. We don't really like it as a game developer, and I think many of our friends also don't like it because it just doesn't feel right to us in some weird way. It's like people play it maybe for the wrong reasons, uh, I think, so it's like, you could say, uh, does it even need to be a game? Would they even do the same if it's a beautiful Excel sheet and they get some money out of it? Is that bad? I don't know. But it's for me not, not, not someone that doesn't feel right. I don't know. I cannot put it in words. Um, still have respect for the guys. I mean, it's crazy good pioneer work. And of course, they deserve their success. But it's not what we want to do. It's not, also not what we believe in, what we want to build for gamers. Um, then we have the terms like play and earn to get a bit more into end. You know, it's not the, the reason to play it, but you can get money. I honestly love much more like play to own. I think we need to get away from earn. We should not have that in the world, uh, in, the, in the genre describing a whole bunch of games because the motivation should not be making money to play the game. It should be fun. Still, it's the primary driver. You play it because it's fun, but you can get ownership. And that's basically what we understand under play to own. So it's, we take best principle and what works from free to play, which is mass adoption, onboarding, is done very beautifully in free to play games. It has to because you need a huge bunch of audience to make these games work. Um, so easy access, for example, no wallet, no token required to play the game. Um, the game plays the core of the game. It is fun to play it, it has deep mechanics. It's even more fun if you play it with friends. And own means you can get ownership and you can trade the items. items. Some of them, maybe, but you don't have to. You don't have to make money if you don't want to, and it's not the reason why you play it, but you get ownership. And it's a difference between if you play where you never really own anything, uh, you basically rent it. It's kind of like a service agreement. Um, and it can also be taken away from you. If the game developer closes down, if he says, like, ah, no, we don't want anymore, you lose all the money you put in. Um, 
So to combine it, it's like play the game because it's fun, but get opportunity to own in-game assets. We are working on this. Um, it's a game we are doing right now. It's a RPG for the Global Esports fan base. It's the first time we announced it in public. It's still very early for us, but basically in the game, you, we have the off-chain part where you can just like play without wallet and token, and at some point you can mint your character on-chain and become pro as an esports athlete. So we kind of like have this journey of amateur player to pro. With your friends, you play in the club, so everyone uh, is basically contributing to the team effort and everyone can push a team. And then I would say top leagues, top tournaments are happening on-chain where you will need to have your character as an NFT, but to get there you can either mint it or you can play to mint. So you can also just like spend time in the game and accumulate enough resources to mint it. Uh, there will be gear as well, and there will be marketplace and trading, so that is basically the idea is to have the global esports audience, which is divided in hubs, Southeast Asia is a lot, a lot of USA, Europe, uh, combine it in a cool game that is fun, where they can play against each other and with each other, with the economy around it, where they can trade the items they earned in the game. Some more stuff on it. And yeah, we're also hiring for it. Uh, so we are based in Berlin, but we, of course, remote is fine. Right now, community manager is a big thing. So we have free-to-play knowledge. We have uh, ship games. We know how to do marketing, live ops, tech, game design, art, everything. But of course, Web3 is a bit, I would say, much more demanding in terms of community. So we're looking for someone here. Um, backend developer, DevOps, Solidity later. Um, if you have any questions, if you want to talk, if you say, like, all you said is shit, I don't believe you, uh, we can talk about it uh, either now or just ping me on, on Telegram and happy to talk about uh, your web free games in the future. Thank you. Any, any questions? <laughs> nah, nothing. All, all agree. Hey. That's good, but it's also bad. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. No, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think it's it's definitely for gamers. It's 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 an opportunity to get something bad and get ownership, and not just like have a money thing. But like I said, a lot of cool guys trying to build it. There's not yet any uh, playbook, so let's see what happens. Uh, if you have any feedback, if you know anyone I should talk to, we are here to learn. Thank you very much.